and uh, it, it is a joy to be introduced, and it really is a deep personal joy to be introduced in relationship to my mother and dad. Dad has been an incredibly wonderful model in ministry, and uh, all of my life I have uh, really looked to him as, uh, as, a, as a mentor and as a model in the best sense of, of that word. Uh, he, he does have a wickedly good sense of humor. Uh, he's a very fine musician, a very, very fine organist and pianist who could play not only the hymn tunes but could handle secular music as well. He's just, just a good, good musician. And he loved to tell people that he used to play for the Edmonds and Eskimos. <laughs> and it's true. He played the organ at the football games at Park Stadium. <laughs> Thinking sports-wise, my, my mother, too, is, a, I think, a, a marvelous model of support in ministry. And she supported that in, uh, in, in his ministry in a, in a very beautiful, wonderful way. But uh, coming here in the midst of uh, Olympic season and the hockey's on television and all that kind of stuff, I, I do recall that my hockey career, which was not fit with much glory, it, uh, I played as a peewee, you know, in, in Edmonton, and, and the only notable thing that happened was that I broke my nose twice. Um, and actually it happened almost a year to the day, the second time. And I always remember going in the house. Now, it had happened the year before, and my nose was all over my face. And then a year later, here it is again. And neither mom nor dad were at the game that night. And when I came in, my mother sort of, oh, hell, look, it's the same one he broke last year. <laughs> I don't know where you go after that, but that's just, that's just the, way, the way that it is. Uh, I did bring sort of greetings from them last night. Um, they are, are remaining in, in their own home. Um, mother will be 90 uh, in April. Uh, Dad is, uh, she, my mother is almost blind now. Uh, macro degeneration has caused a great difficulty for her and her seeing. Dad has been the caregiver now for a period of time, but he's beginning to have some problems with his legs and with circulation to his feet. I appreciate you remembering them in your prayers. Uh, their spirits remain very, very good. Dad keeps preaching. He does not know how to say no. And it doesn't matter which church, where it is, uh, he preaches most Sundays. And uh, God, I think, in a beautiful way, still continues, continues to use them. So thank you, Norman, for... And also for recalling the time that we spent in the Okanagan Valley as young ministers uh, trying to learn the skills of, of evangelism. Well, it's been a great day here. It's been a tremendous day. Uh, I think that the seminars that I attended today were extraordinarily helpful. And I hope that each one of you is uh, feeling that this has been a very worthwhile experience to have. For those of you who weren't here last night, we really kind of tried to lay the biblical basis for what we're going to be doing tonight and tomorrow night and then again Thursday night uh, by looking at the passage in the fourth chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians and, and trying to, to understand the ministry as an apostolic calling. That's what Paul said in the very first verse of 1 Corinthians. But an apostolic calling in which we are servants and stewards of the mysteries of God. Think of us this way, servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Tonight, I, I would like to try to look at why the ministry of stewardship in particular, why that stewardship ministry is such a difficult ministry for us in the culture in which we live. And I want to begin rather slowly and then work towards a critique of the consumer culture that is so much a part of our lives. I did say to you last night that I, I hope that I will have to leave to you the translation with regards to 
how what I'm saying tonight uh, reflects Canadian society. I have been gone from Canada long enough now that I don't assume that I'm able to do that. But my feeling is, from watching just a few minutes of television uh, on your radio, on your television stations, that uh, many of the forces that are impacting American life through the consumer culture are certainly impacting Canadian life as well. But uh, much of what I will be reflecting is what I see happening in our churches in the United States. And my guess is that it should be fairly close to what, to what is happening in Canada. Now, to come at it, let, let's begin with some biblical questions. There's a very powerful biblical question that I think we need to ask about stewardship and the living of our lives. The first is from Isaiah, the 55th chapter in the second verse. If you want a question for our day, ask this. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? What an amazing question. And what a question that relates to the fact that for all that we have, we do not seem satisfied. It's a very probing, probing question. I want to ask a second question from Scripture. And the second question from Scripture comes from the 16th chapter of Matthew, the 26th verse. This is probably better known than the Isaiah question. What does it profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? the kind of a consumer enough is never enough society in which we live. That probing question of Jesus, in a way, I hope will be at the roots of what we are, we are talking about tonight. This is not a question from Jesus, but if there is an overall text for this evening, it probably would be Matthew 6.33. Again, a verse that you know very well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things will be added unto you. Now, why I want that verse before us is to say, when you begin to try and do a critique on the consumer culture, it's very easy to begin to look as if you're against everything. You're against wealth, you're against riches, you're against business. You're, you're sort of putting the whole of the culture down. And I really don't want to do that. I want to affirm at the beginning that this is not a diatribe against wealth. Wealth is given by God to some. It is given to be used as good stewards. And the issue is not so much do we have the wealth or don't we, but do we have, are we good stewards of that which God has given. I also tonight don't want to look as if I'm opposed to the creation of capital. Because the society that we live in really depends upon that. There is an important place in the culture in which we are living for business people. And it is important bus for business people to do their work well. The jobs, the giving, this university, in many ways all depend on the creation of capital. So please understand that I'm trying to walk a kind of a tightrope. I'm trying to walk a rope which accepts the fact that wealth, that the creation of wealth, that good business practices certainly need to be a part of the communities in which we live. But in the end, all of that has to be placed in the context of the words of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things will be added unto you. So that the consumer comforts, the consumer goods that so many live for and almost die for, they are in themselves never able to take first place in our lives. So that's, uh, that's where we want to come to as we think about the consumer culture. I want to share with you three assumptions 
that are in my heart as I've worked with churches on issues around giving and stewardship, and particularly the, the money side of stewardship, which we will be talking about mostly tonight. I came to this ministry, the Ministry of Mission Support, nearly 10 years ago. It was not necessarily a vocation that I sought. I never saw myself as someone who would be helping to raise the money for a mission. Uh, that had never been ever in my mind, but when the call came, it, I, I really felt, and my wife Joan has been very supportive through all of this, we found that God was calling me to do this, and I've done it with a lot of energy and with a, with a lot of joy. But as I came to it, I think I, I, I came with the perception that the problem in churches was that people were kind of stingy. Uh, that, 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 you know, the only problem was they just wouldn't give, you know, they just wouldn't, wouldn't let go of it. And maybe, maybe a tad, maybe sometimes a tad mean and a tad nasty, that sort of thing, but just weren't going to let that go. I have really changed my opinion on that as I've worked with people over a long period of time. I have found that deep down, Christians want to give. I found that really, in, in their hearts, for I've led tithing seminars across the United States, I've led several in Canada and around the world. I don't know that in serious conversation with anyone, I've ever had anybody come up to me and say, I would never want to do that. That's a horrible kind of a thing to think about. Giving 10%. That's not the reaction. The reaction is, I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> the desire, the deep desire of Christians is to give. And I want to probe that for just a minute with you. Because I think that the stewardship or the giving crisis in our churches is really caused when you see it in depth as an incredible clashing of the spirit of the age with the spirit of the Christ. And that is one of these great words you can use around a seminary, ontologically. I never really knew what that meant, but I'd love to say it. <laughs> ontologically. <laughs> Down deep. What, you, what you've got is, is the clash of these two spirits. The spirit of the Christ, which ultimately says, my body broken for you. And the spirit of the age, with its trinity of me, mine, and more. The dominant verb of the kingdom is to give. The dominant verb of the culture is to get. And those are contradictory. And it is, it is in the clash of those spirits that the stewardship struggle within the churches takes its place. Everything about the culture that we live in is about getting. <coughs> getting, grabbing, holding, locking, securing, not letting go. Everything about the kingdom <coughs> is about giving. Now, I want to press that. Everything in the kingdom is about giving. I think we have misunderstood at times the reason why Christians give. See, we usually say to people the reason why Christians give is that the church needs money to function. And that is not the reason why Christians give. Now, I know the church needs money to function. I know the church needs to handle its business well, that it needs to have high integrity in its dealings. I understand that. But again, ontologically, looking at this thing in depth, you've got to say that the reason why Christians give is not simply that the church bills can be paid. The reason why Christians give is that giving is the nature of God. Giving reflects God. Every identification of God in the scriptures 
is of a giving God, so that the creating God gives the creation. The Son gives His life. The Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit gives gifts. So that in every manifestation of God in the Scriptures, the nature of God is benevolent. Now that's incredibly good news. The heart of the universe is benevolent. It is not malignant. And that is the source of the hope of the Christian. And, and that needs to be the underlying support for what we kind of so blindly talk about from time to time as the stewardship message. If indeed it is true that we are created in the image of God, we strengthen, develop, or do you want to use the word, shine that image by being like the one in whose image we were formed. That is where generosity and grace and giving come into play. And in this kind of a world, when you begin to talk to people about giving, when you begin to talk about this kind of a message, you suddenly begin to feel the brakes go on. And that's where people are caught in the tension between the gospel and the consumer culture in which we live. Now, with that as background, I, I want us to look at the consumer culture to try to see if we can understand some of its marks. Let's ask a kind of a beginning question. Are we stewards, fundamentally, or are we consumers? Now, I know that living in this culture, we're going to consume. But is our primary identity before God as a steward or as a culture? The world calls us consumers, purchasers, shoppers, clients, patrons, buyers, producers, investors, or owners. The gospel calls us stewards, caretakers, managers, administrators, servants, disciples, trustees, givers, witnesses. Do you get the difference? Just by the way that we are addressed. Now, I've been using this word consumerism fairly flippantly here, and you may say, well, what do you mean by consumerism? What's your definition of it? Well, I started out with Webster, okay? Here's the common definition of the word consumer. The economic theory that a progressively greater consumption of goods is beneficial. And that didn't preach very well. So, I tried to create my own definition of consumerism. So for this evening, don't... Just for this evening, forget Webster and this is Roberts. The chronic purchasing of new goods and services with little attention to real need, desirability, debt, or the environmental consequences of their manufacture in the belief that such behavior brings personal fulfillment and social benefit. So that consumerism is chronic. And it has to do with the satisfaction of our individual needs with little regard for the consequences. Now, that kind of a broad definition lacks an awful lot of specificity. And I've been working on trying to describe consumerism more accurately and to get a better feel for it. So what I'd like to do in the next time, next few moments in our lecture is to identify for you what I consider to be 12 marks of the consumer culture. And we're going to go through them one after another. Now, if my kids were here, they'd die. They know that I can make a three-point sermon go for 40 minutes. 
And the thought of me handling 12 points in one evening, probably beyond their perceptions. They don't think that would be possible. I'm going to try to move fairly quickly. And in so doing, I want to identify the behavior. I want to speak about, uh, to give you a definition of this mark of consumerism, to identify the behavior. I want to reflect for just a moment with each one of them upon the scriptures. Because one of the things that, in my mind, as we live in this kind of a culture, I think it is very important for the church to present to the culture a viable alternative. That it isn't just enough to say, don't do this and don't do that, but there has got to be in the way that we respond a viable alternative. And when we're finished, I'm going to try to draw together both from Scripture and just for some, some observations, some of the ways by which we can begin to move in providing a viable alternative to the overwhelming culture that, that we are facing. So, here goes. One of the first marks of the consumer culture is called commodification. What does commodification mean? That means that everything or everyone um, can be bought. That things, that values, that people can be purchased. There is a price on everything. Um, you, you see this behavior really all, all around us. It's, it's, it does not make the distinction between the things that money can buy and the things that money can't buy. And, and one of the things I think the church has always got to be doing is to remind the culture that there are some things that money cannot buy. That money cannot buy fulfillment. That money or the things that money can buy cannot buy joy. They cannot buy happiness. They cannot buy peace. They cannot buy good relationships. They cannot ultimately buy a relationship with God. But the commodified society thinks that if, if I want it, if I like it, I'll buy it. The scripture verse I'd like to bring to your mind as you think about commodification is a verse in Acts. It's in the uh, eighth chapter and the, the ninth verse and following. It's the story of uh, Simon. I mentioned it in the talk back earlier this afternoon. Simon the magician, the magician Heather, who is converted, and who suddenly sees one of the apostles perform a miracle wants to buy the power, wants to buy the Holy Spirit. You've got the incredibly strong response to Scripture. Your money will do you no good. You cannot buy the power of God. So mark number one is the mark of commodification. Mark number two is the mark of insatiability. Said easily, it means enough is never enough that you always want more. And that we are never satisfied with what we have. There sort of is no ending to it. What we have, we, we, we like and we want, but we want more of it. We are a culture that is overwhelmed with compulsivity. We were talking about some of the sexual compulsivities in one of the sessions today. There are compulsivities in every direction. We eat too much. Sometimes we work too often and too hard. Uh, we, are, we are full of, of too much. We don't seem to be able to stop at anything. And, and that is fed by the consumer society that encourages us <coughs> for more and for more and for more. If you want a biblical word to do some exegesis on, with regards to insatiability. Take the incredibly powerful word that Jesus uses. It is the Greek word pleonexia. Pleonexia is most often simply translated as covetousness. But that word misses it. Pleonexia is an insatiable desire for more. And what Jesus says is, beware of pleonexia of every kind. 
And in this culture, look at the wide variety of 12-step groups which are dealing with the wide variety of compulsivities which we seem to be encouraging by our style of life. Mark number three is the adoration of the unpossessed. It's kind of feeling that if only we can get what we don't have, we'll be happy. And I use the word adoration intentionally because in all of this there is a way in which mammon so easily is, becomes an idolatry and challenges the place of God in our lives. So that what we are adoring is not the creation or the creator who has given us the creation. It is not the Lord who has given his life. It is not the spirit who gives the gifts. But what we are adoring is what we don't have and what we just wish if we could only get that, we know that we would be happy. Three attitudes prevail. A deep desire for things. A jealousy towards those who have the things that we don't have. And a willingness to go into any amount of debt in order to get it. And it drives us, and of course, it is, it is encouraged by the television culture which surrounds us. Fourth mark is winner take all. Winner take all. Now, the easiest thing here is to jump about the athletes and say, let's, if you, if you want to really have a marvelous illustration of winner take all, look at the sports pages. Uh, sports pages really aren't about sports anymore. They're about salaries. <coughs> and, and you have the most incredible things happening. I mean, I've always enjoyed sports, and so I kind of have always followed this kind of thing. But we've got in the United States something that's called the National Football League. You know that. Uh, the National Football League uh, signed a television contract for millions of dollars. In fact, the size of the contract with two television networks is probably worth more than the value of all of the teams in the National Football League put together. That's the, that's the craziness about the numbers that we're talking about when we talk about athletics and about sports. And what's happening is that the winners, the very good players, are getting more and more and more the average players are plateaued. They're getting more than they, than by any other standard you would say it would be worth. But to the winner goes goes the most. But you know it isn't only in, in sports, and I want to jump to that. I was reading in one of the newspapers the other day that if Michael Jordan continued to get the same salary that he's getting today until he was a hundred years of age that he still would have less than a third of what Bill Gates, the Microsoft designer, has today. So that the massive amounts of money are flowing not simply to the athletes, but it's true in business. I hear sometimes that this kind of winner-take-all can work in academia, where if there is a professor who is able to draw many, many students, at least this is the phenomenon in the United States, that that particular professor can begin to demand higher and higher and higher salaries, far beyond that of the norm, far beyond that of which the average had ever thought of, of attaining, but because particularly of the drawing power of that person, that, that will happen. It's winner take all. It's, and it's, it's a part of the consumer culture. I, I love to tell the story about a guy by the name of Will Clark, played first base for the Boston Red Sox back in 95. Now, he was receiving a salary of three and a half million dollars, which, believe it or not, since 1995, that's a modest salary uh, in terms of what others have gone on to be able to be been able to get. But Will Clark, halfway through the year, had to declare personal bankruptcy on a three and a half million dollar salary. 
You know what happened to him? He had a hobby, and his hobby was antique cars. And he got overextended in the purchase of antique cars, so that at three and a half million dollars, sorry, he had to declare bankruptcy. Now, let me tell you why I, I share that story. I think that story is, is a parable. It's a parable of a nation or of a continent that has more resources than any people have had in the history of humankind. And yet that society is going bankrupt because it does not know how to use wisely and well the resources that God has given. Number five. We're going to leave money for a minute so you can kind of breathe easily here. <laughs> Number five is called hecticity. And hecticity is a part of uh, the consumer culture. It's not busyness. It's more than busyness. It's because it is, it is busyness with nervous tension and stress thrown all over it. One of our missionaries returned uh, actually from Thailand and landed in Los Angeles airport. And she said to me, you know, she said, when I looked at the people in the Los Angeles airport in LAX, she said, my first inclination was to get on the airplane and fly back to Thailand. She said, honestly, it, it looked as if every one of them was having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> we do not perceive how others see the way that we live. And it is this character of life that's called hecticity. Now, some of it is a direct result of economics because of the pressures put upon families and the culture in which we live, where one job is not enough, and where there need to be two jobs, and where now two jobs are not enough, and somebody has to work another half a job, so that families get more and more extended in their working, have less and less time with one another, with disastrous kind of results. You can see it in us in the stress that, that, that's on us. I wish sometimes that, that Christians here in North America could go and observe Christian churches in, in other parts of the world. Places where people have almost nothing compared to what we have. And yet when you look at them, their lives are not driven by the stressful hecticity that is so much a part of everything that we do. Mark number five. We're not doing too badly. Mark number six. <laughs> Instant gratification. You can never put off the purchase. You want what you want, and you want it now. And instant gratification is one of the doorways into what will be the seventh of our marks, which is the mark of death. Because very often what instant gratification ends up saying is buy now and pay it later. And uh, if you have to go into debt, go ahead. Get it. You want it. Get it now. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about instant gratification because I want to spend a little bit more time talking about indebtedness. I think it, is, it behooves us as church leaders to begin to teach our people financial planning begin to teach people how to use wisely and well the resources that God has given. I would hope that in your church you would explore good, sound, Christian financial planning. Let me tell you, it will be an evangelistic <coughs> outreach to that generation that people call the busters. The people 20s to 35. That generation is much more interested in the white shoes of money than the so-called boomers, their older brothers and sisters. Many of the busters are worried that the, the, 
The boomer generation is the biggest generation to have lived in our society. And, and many busters are afraid that the boomers are going to use it all up and there won't be anything left for them. And they want to be wise about the way that they handle their money. Debt, I believe, is a major spiritual problem in the life of many, many Christians. Plastic has made it too easy. And make no mistake about it, the focus of the banks and of the credit card companies in our society is upon the young. The ages at which the offers for credit cards are, it gets lower and lower all of the time. So I'm sure around a university campus it is very common to be offered a free credit card. Let me suggest that that is one of the worst oxymorons <laughs> that you could ever hear. Because if there's anything, one of those cards is not, it is free. There is a price. In fact, I wish we could put a little tag on there that says, this card may be detrimental to your financial health. <laughs> I, I'm trying not to be negative and say that all credit is wrong. Of course, that's not true. I think in a wise Christian financial plan, wisely used, properly managed, there is a place for, for, for credit and, and for manageable debt. But what's happened is that manageable debt has become unmanageable, and the phrase for the day is max it out. So that the cards get maxed out, so that a person ends up owing more money than their income. And at that point, I believe the book of Proverbs is absolutely correct, that indebtedness has become indeed a, a master, and we are in bondage, in bondage to it. I look at my grandchildren, and one of the things <laughs> that I go out of my way to try to teach them, and they're just, they're six, four, five, six years of age, is to say, learn what I call the 10 10 80. 10 10 80 is that you give 10% of what you're given to the Lord. It comes off the top. It's the first gift, it's the first fruits. You save 10%. And you learn to live on 80%. And you are wise about the way that you spend the 80%. Because let's make sure we hear the message of Christian stewardship. The, mes the message of Christian stewardship is not that just 10% belongs to God, and then we do it along with the rest. 100% belongs to God. And we need to be wise stewards of all of that. But helping people to move away from indebtedness. I, I think it's something that we have watched happen. Pastors, I encourage you to talk about the wise use of credit in your preaching and teaching ministries. People want to hear about that. They need to hear about that. They will thank you to hear about that. And teach the children. Oftentimes, these kinds of things I'm talking about are hard for adults to take. And they turn you off very quickly. If you teach their children, their children will become a conduit for the message to their parents. I led a tithing seminar one time in the United States. A pastor came up to me after the service and he said, I have 14 active credit cards in my life. Incredible. Compulsively, he was never able to say no. And any time he was offered that credit, he just accepted it. And his wife was in terrible bondage. Fortunately, there that day was a member of what a group that we call the Ministers and Missionaries Benefit Board, which is our pension board in the United States, and a very wise Christian financial planner was the staff member for that group in that area. And I followed them. They've worked together, this pastor and this staff member. <coughs> Slowly but surely, that staff member has begun to move out of debt and has begun to be able to handle. And one of the things that they have done, one of the first things they did, was to take a big pair of scissors and to take 14 credit cards and to cut them up into tiny pieces. By the way, 
spending more time on this one than I should, but let me say this. You know one of the most things that makes a, a financial plan Christian? People will say, I'm in debt, what can I do? I'm in debt, what I, I owe more when I get my check. My bills are higher than my income. The first mark of a Christian financial plan is prayer. You begin to pray, to ask God to help you move out of this indebtedness. You confess that this is a spiritual problem. This is more than a money problem. We need to be helping our people to deepen their spirits by learning how to be wise and good stewards in the name of Christ. Let me move quickly to the next one, which is, which is deprivation. You know what's unbelievable? In this culture where we've got more than people have ever had, we feel deprived. We don't feel blessed. We, we, we have, we're, we're uncomfortable because somehow we don't have more. We see other people who have something that we don't have, and, and you would think that we would reflect a great sense of being blessed and thankfulness to God, but the consumer culture never lets the pressure off. The consumer culture always pushes you, always to have more, always to want more. And the result is that we never come to a point in our lives where we're, we are able to settle down and to say, we have had enough. I hope for you that you discover the wonder of 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Listen to what 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says. It says that godliness with contentment is great gain. The culture has almost made the word con contentment a bad word. We're not supposed to be content. We're always supposed to want. We're supposed to desire. But the power of Scripture to learn to be content, godliness plus contentment, is great gain. I've heard many, many sermons and preached many sermons on godliness is great gain, and it is. I don't often hear from our pulpits that contentment is great gain. It's all a part of this pressure that's on us and, and the feeling of being deeply, deeply deprived. Self-absorption. I want what I want when I want it. The extra resources we need for ourselves. And we begin to lose the sense of caring, of compassion for those that are around us. I often think of... Uh, the rich young ruler in this regard, who had so much, but who ultimately was so self-absorbed that he walked away from Jesus. The selfishness, the self-centeredness, the self-absorption of the culture it is so obvious. Three others, number nine is devalued vocation. I worry about this as I relate to young people. I want to hear young people ask, help young people to ask a different question. The question of the culture with regards to a job or a profession or a calling is how much will I make? Rather than that sense of God's calling. I, I worry about the fact that we have devalued what it means to be called of God. Not just for pastors. Because I, I believe that the biblical teaching of vocation is far beyond that only professional church leaders are called by God in the service. I believe school teachers are called. I believe doctors are called. I believe lawyers are called. I believe agriculturalists are called. I think God calls people to a wide, wide variety of useful, productive work. But we have trivialized that. 
And it all comes down to how much will I make? So that the ultimate decisions of life are always made with a dollar sign somehow hanging over them. Number 11 is that the environment is abused. And over and over again, we see that. It really is questionable how long the whole globe can, can stand the excesses, and I'll put this in terms of the United States, of the lifestyle in the United States. When you look at our garbage dumps, when you look at the rich and fertile land that we are plowing under to be used for every kind of construction, when you begin to see the wanton cutting down of rainforests, you've got to say that even the environment is going to weep and groan for the way by which this society seems to demand more and more and more. I think one of the important things about the Christian understanding of ecology is that one of the reasons, in fact, the reason why we care for the is that it is one of the ways in which we praise the Creator. It is one of the ways that we say thank you to the Creator for the incredible beauty and wonder of the creation that has been given. Now we come to number 12. We've made it through to all 12 of them. This is, in, in one way, we've maybe touched some of this. Number 12 is escalation of needs. You think that if I can just get that need met, then we'll put that behind us and life will settle down. <laughs> but it doesn't happen that way. When that need gets met, you then do not have no needs, but those needs multiply. And when you get there, then there are three or four additional things that you have to have. And as you reach out to get the three or four additional things, there are three or four additional things to each one of those. And, and so that there is never a sense of satisfaction. We have lost completely the distinction between what we need and what we want. So that we really don't talk anymore about basic needs. Wants have become a part of our needs. And we see them as necessities. I was driving by a large housing development. And that's another question. Why do we always need such huge houses as are being built across the countryside in our time? Why does the average American family need a three-car garage? Do you know why? So they can put the stuff that we bought that we don't need in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. I, I don't know, maybe this isn't true in Canada, but I'm shocked <laughs> at the number at the number of storage places across the country where we put the junk that we thought we needed so badly. But all it did was clutter up our houses. And we had to get rid of it, but we God forbid we could give it to someone who needs it. <laughs> so we stick it in a storage bin somewhere. I think it's an amazing, amazing indicator of, of the power of the consumer culture around us. It's just the growth of these storage places all, all over the countryside. But I was driving by this housing development, and here was the sign. Now you can afford all the luxury you need. <laughs> you got it. I don't need to say any more. Their little luxury. Don't you cry. You'll be a necessity by and by. <laughs> on and on it moves. Now, let's come back again. This is not a decrying of wealth. This is not a put down of business. This is not a denial of the reality that there needs to be capital generated within a society. This is an attack upon a consumer culture which puts first the things that money can buy. 
and leaves God to some other place. Now, in closing, I, I want to just raise some biblical motifs and to say that I think in a way these biblical motifs could speak rather powerfully to our time. And then just end my time with you tonight by giving some practical suggestions about some of the things that we can respond in terms of doing to try to help counterbalance the constant force of the consumer culture in our minds. I'm fascinated by some of the practices of the Old Testament which speak directly to some of the most troubling issues that we face in the consumer society. What are some of the most troubling issues? Money is one. Food is another. Time is another. And stress is certainly yet another. Now when I mention these, please hear me clearly. I'm not wanting to call for a new legalism. I'm not trying to establish new rules and orders for the life of the church. But I'm wondering if there is anything in our past that can help inform us as we move into the future. Is there something in yesterday that can help us for the tomorrow? Not a new legalism, because all of these lend themselves very easily to that. But under grace, a new way of discovering discipline and purpose. It's interesting to me that there is so much in the Bible about the tithe in relationship to our problem over money. And I have found in teaching really hundreds of people the importance of tithing that one of the things that is said to me more often than anything else is that tithing has helped to bring a sense of discipline into, into my financial planning, into my handling of money. But in our confusion over money, there stands the time. In our problems with food, and I have to be very careful how I preach this, because, but it's true, we do struggle with food in this culture. There is the ancient tradition of the fast. Fasting and praying. Now, I'm not asking us to reach back and impose that upon people, but can't we learn something from what is taught in the scriptures about the fast in relationship <coughs> to the overeating which characterizes my life? And I don't say that lightly, that's kind of confession time. Our time. I mean, one of the things that we've heard at this conference is the pressure on pastors, the shortage of time. There are many people who are saying that the new currency is not money, the new currency is time. I kind of hear over and over again people say, I'll give you my money, just don't ask me for my time. That more important to the person at the end of this century is an hour that is a dollar. And there stands the sad tradition of the Old Testament, the setting aside of the time for the honoring and the worship of God and for the enjoyment of one another. I have a young pastor whom I've worked with rather closely. He lives in Iowa. And he regularly takes a Sabbath every Tuesday. <laughs> I said to him, how can you take a Sabbath on a Tuesday? And he said to me, Sunday is far too busy to be the Sabbath. <laughs> you know, there's wisdom there. There's wisdom there. Finding time. Setting a time, priority time for God, for relationships, for one another. And then in the midst of the stress and the tension, there stands the symbol of the Jubilee. The capacity to let go. And the capacity, the Jubilee, was the return of the land. But the idea of the Jubilee is, is, is the letting go of what we possess. Letting it be. And in the midst
midst of a culture that finds grasping and holding and hoarding so important? Could there be in that ancient symbol a power that could inform us? Very quickly, some things to do. I think one of the most important things is to begin to help people question the consumer culture. And if you want to begin specifically at one point, help children question what they see on television. The advertisers of our land are focused on our children. I spent a day at Disneyland within the last few weeks, and of course it was great fun. But I was very aware of the fact that that day was focused on indelibly imprinting the Mickey Mouse logo in the minds of those children. Because that company knows that if they can get that child, they will have a lifelong consumer. And what I'm saying is, in the name of Christ, help children to question that. And when you're watching television, help children to know that what is portrayed is false. That those promises cannot be fulfilled. And a good, strong, healthy skepticism towards advertising is, is a very important thing to help children attain. I think number two is to emphasize the importance of giving. You're not surprised to hear me say that. But I really do believe that properly understood giving can be a way of standing against the excesses of the culture around us. And that there is a joy in giving. It's far beyond the joy of receiving because it is in line with the nature of God as we said earlier. And encouraging people to give not just their money but graciousness as a lifestyle. Learning to give thought and care learning to give time, learning to give ears that will listen, willing to give hands that will help, but that the whole thrust of giving is so contradictory to the thrust of getting that's in the culture that you do, in a way, stand against it as you learn to be a giving, a gracious person. I think number three is to say simplify. I think we need to learn to live more simply. I think it is very important for us to be good stewards and to try and find those things in our lives which have so cluttered them and to let them go and to let them be. I think it may well be that around churches it is important to have some group support in this. It's very hard stuff to do by yourself. But I know many of our churches, there are small groups who are trying to help one another learn to live more simply. One of the results of that can often be giving more strongly so that the mission and ministry which has been given to Christ's church can be strengthened and supported and sustained. Last night I tried to pull it all together with a story. And I want to do the same tonight. But you have been so gracious. Do you mind if I go on for another five minutes and I'll be finished? Roses are red, violets are blue. Give them five minutes and you'll probably be through. <laughs> <laughs> I got on the airplane. Got on the airplane. <clears throat> Next to the window was a young man. A long legal pad in his hand. And he was busy writing. I was sitting on the aisle. Uh, we were in Philadelphia and we were flying across the continent to the west coast. And he never looked up when I sat down. He was busy writing. And the airplane took off and he stopped writing just long enough for the plane to get off the ground and in the air, his trade table up and 
As soon as we were in the air, the trade, 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 trade table came back down and it was raining again. Well, I was a little curious. I'm, I'm fairly gregarious, so I end up <coughs> trying to get in conversation with people. And I looked over and what he had was interesting. It had kind of circles and squares and dotted lines and arrows and that sort of thing. And what I thought was that it was some kind of an organizational plan for his business. That's what it looked like to me. And so we got up in the air and uh, we're flying. And eventually they came to serve us a meal. And he put his stuff away. And at that point we struck up a conversation. I said, what are you doing? Um, I'm just really interested. You're really, you're really into it, you know. And uh, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a financial planner. <coughs> and I just graduated from college on the East Coast. So I got a job at this new company. And I'm on my first assignment to the West Coast. And it's really important. I'm seeing a number of very important clients, and if I do this well, I just know that it will really, really help my work. And he said, I'm, I'm preparing my presentations. And it's terrific, you know, and uh, we talked a little bit. And I don't know how it slid around to this, but we focused only on him. We never talked about me, and I, we ended up, my saying to him something like, well, are you going to make this presentation face-to-face? -face? I called him, I said, yes. And I said, well, would you like to try it out on me? I'd like to be a guinea pig. He said, would you do that? That would be terrific. He said, I'd really like to do that. So he pulls out his, what I thought was his organizational page, and he said, okay, ignore everything else on this page. But he said, I want you to look at the box at the top of the page. And sure enough, when I saw it up close, there was this box right at the top of the page, and all of the lines and circles and dots fell below that. He said, now I tell you what I want you to do. You tell me, what's the most important thing in the world to you? What do you want more than you want anything else? <laughs> what is the one thing that you die for? Because he said, we're going to put that in the box at the top of the page. And then he said, everything underneath that, we're going to plan how you are going to succeed in attaining what you put at the top of the page. Do you want to own your own company? <laughs> I laughed at that. He had no idea what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Our head offices are a funny round building in Pennsylvania. I mean, what the world would you do with that? But <laughs> He said, do you want to be a millionaire within the decade? He said, do you want to have a specific amount of money that you can give to your children on retirement? And then he stopped and he said, it looks like you're moving to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there are really only two kinds, right? Those moving towards and those moving beyond. <laughs> but anyway. So he came back and he said, now, what is for you the most important thing in the world? Well, you should never ask anybody who's, going, who's been to seminary that question. I mean, I've got all kinds of ontological problems with that. So I thought about it for a while and I said, can I put God in the box at the top of the page. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a Baptist preacher. You know, all the people in here. No. He said, you can't put God in the box at the top of that page. He said, you can't play this game that way. <laughs> now, I want to say two things about that. First of all, I'm not putting down financial planning. You've heard me say over and over again that wise financial planning is an important thing in Christian life. So you know that. But 
what I am saying is that the ultimate question for you and for me is what's at the top of the page. And if it is God, our lives will be different than if it is things or the things that money can buy. Seek first.